Ah, Christmas. It's a time to spend with family, friends, and loved ones. A time of giving, of thinking of others. And for nerdy internet reviewers, a time to scramble for fresh content. What can you say about the holiday media that hasn't already been said by so many others? I've been super busy this year. Don't worry, it's a good kind of busy. And thanks to Try, I'm still on a pretty big Digimon kick. So this holiday season, I'm going to hone in on one of the most infamous episodes from one of the most notorious series. The World Tour series from Digimon Zero Two. There's no denying the writing in this run of episodes was, well, lacking. Every country the kids visit is reduced to horrible stereotypes, and the possibility for new adventures in all these faraway lands goes mostly untapped. Still, there are some merits to the world tour. It introduced the idea of Diddy Dustin from all over the world, and it split the original kids up into several groups of two, meaning characters who didn't often get to interact directly suddenly had screen time together. And because I'll never get tired of producing Digimon content, let's take a look at that world tour series and rank the countries visited from most lame to least lame. Well, my friends, good luck on your journeys. We shall meet again. It's Christmas time and it's hot. I'm sweating more now than the last time I got my teeth cleaned at the dentist. And what is probably the least clever pairing in the world tour series, Joe and Cody are both sent to Australia. Uh, from a writing standpoint, I can at least understand why they did this. They both have aquatic Digimon, and that's the gimmick of the day. But if that's the angle they're going for, they could at least have given us an epic water fight. And yeah, they do bring up the point about how they don't want to fight in the water and damage the coral reefs, and I can respect that. But, okay, so drive them out into deeper waters and go at it. The whole beating the evil Digimon by threatening to eat them is just beyond ridiculous. We don't even get to see the Digimon knock down the control spire. For some reason, the weak human kids help pull it down. Poor Joe. One of your rare appearances in Zero Two. A complete and total letdown. Hey Derek, I've got another question. Why do they call it Down Under? It's not really under anything. Wow, check out the Eiffel Tower! That's gotta be the world's tallest Christmas tree. The international Digestions are severely lacking in character as it is. Did they really need to make one of them a damsel in distress? Would it have been so bad to show Catherine trying to fight off the monsters herself? Even if she was scared, even if she was badly outmatched, that would at least have been better than her sitting around waiting to be rescued. I'll give the Paris segment one thing. For once it's not a dub change that the random stranger giving the kids a lift is actually a family member. Michelle really is TK's grandfather. And it's a nice little expanded canon. Plus, Ty teaming up with TK is a nice nostalgic throwback to all those times in Adventure that Ty played the surrogate big brother while Matt was off brooding. And at least we get a fight scene. Although I never understood why they only introduced the other French Diddy Destined at the end of the segment. At that point, why bother? There's just so little going on here. Goodbye! For Central Park. That's cool. They're sending all the Digimon our way because they know we're the only ones who can handle the job. Oh, New York. There is no reason you shouldn't be higher up on this list. This segment had so much potential. For starters, it had possibly the most clever team up in the World Tour series, Mimi and Davis. Two characters who normally don't get screen time together, and Mimi isn't one of the characters Davis is supposed to be a proxy for. If you ever watched Yezu Otaku's Digimon retrospectives, you may remember that she actually compared Davis to Mimi. Both have led pretty happy lives, neither are very deep thinkers, and while they're both treated as relatively shallow, they're both actually very compassionate. Plus, Davis's personality is big enough for the Big Apple. It just makes sense to send him there. And once he is there, he meets not one, but five new Digidestined. Davis is all about interpersonal relationships, so this is the perfect scenario for him. They had all the ingredients for a sweet setup, and what do they do with it? Ugh, I don't know why, but I always got the worst secondhand embarrassment for this segment, even as a kid. I guess I can give them points for not having a gorilla mon climb the Empire State Building, but really? A tree attacking a tree, that's the best you could come up with? Davis's charm manages to make the whole escapade fun. 
and all the elements are there for an entertaining scenario, but it could have been executed a lot better. What monsters? Huh? I don't see any monsters around here. <laughs> You're Anna and Sonia, Yuri. <laughs> The Russian segment used to really bore me as a kid, but as I've gotten older, I can appreciate it more. For one thing, it's nice that at least one segment has a language barrier that isn't completely or conveniently written off. For another, it gives Yoli a rare chance to actually shine as a character. Yoli had the potential to be a really interesting personality. She likes very girly and feminine things, but she is also very smart and tech savvy, a combination that you still don't see a lot in children's media. But more often than not, she's just not allowed to do anything for the team. She spends most of her time screaming and running. But when the kids split up and suddenly there are no dominant leader personalities like Ty or Davis, Yoli is the one to step in and fill that void. And she's brilliant at it! Her way of working around the language barrier is clever and resourceful. And it makes the most of the convenient little writing point that all of the kids here have flying Digimon. It's still a little on the boring side, at least for my taste, but it's definitely one of the better written segments. We don't need a translator to explain that. We may not understand each other, but growling tummies are universal. And you three guys are the digi-destined children of Hong Kong. No, we're not. We're the Poi brothers. Putting aside the fact that the Hong Kong segment begins with Kari literally descending from the sky as an angel of mercy, there's a lot to like going on here. For one, it gives us another team-up of characters who don't get a lot of screen time together. And with Izzy as the brains and Kari as the heart, it's a nice pairing to watch. And yeah, it's annoying that the Poi brothers only exist to further support the idea that Kari is apparently the most desirable creature in the universe, but at least they have some pretty cool partners. And the scope of this segment is pretty big, story-wise. The kids have to help an Indian Digidestin cross the border into China. And after some tense discussion, they decide on the diplomatic approach, asking and receiving permission to cross the border without a fight. It perfectly lays the groundwork for the world's crossing over at the end of the series, and I absolutely love it. Plus, we get to see Angel Woman and Mecha Kabuterimon together again. Awesome. Hey, why are you the one that gets to shake Kari's hand? Hello there. <laughs> Digimon are trying to hide in the Mayan ruins to the east of here. We better get over there before they take the place apart. Most of the world tour segments are lame, boring, or disappointing. Mexico is the only one that manages to be outright entertaining when Wormon becomes overly possessive of Ken and jealous of a seven-year-old human girl. There's just something the tiniest bit uncomfortable about watching a young fangirl and a digital worm fighting for Ken's attention. But that just adds to the hilarity. After so much boring nonsense, Mexico is just a breath of fresh air. It's also one of the few segments to acknowledge the language barrier. And in the original dialogue, Rosa speaks only in Spanish. And Ken, having retained at least some of his former genius, does the translating. It's a workaround that furthers character development and doesn't rely on the Jedi equals magic translator explanation. And Mexico gives us an actual fight scene. Even though the characters do take care to mention that they can't fight in the ruins themselves because they don't want to damage the last remains of a bygone civilization. And maybe Matt teaming up with Ken is a bit obvious, Ken being Matt's proxy for both the brooding loner and Lancer characters, but when all is said and done, Mexico's ridiculous hilarity is far and away the best part of the Digimon World Tour. Hey Ken, how do you say thank you in Spanish? Gracias. Gracias, Rosa. Thank you so much for your continued support. If you have any thoughts about the World Tour series, anything you liked or didn't like, or any ideas for Digimon videos that I could do in the future, let me know. Thanks again for watching, and as always, I'm eternally optimistic, wishing you a very Merry Christmas. Keep on love, keep on love, keep on